Hi there. Um, I want to talk about uh, Nobel Literature Laureates. Um, there have been about 110 or something um, uh, since the start of the prize, um, and uh, they missed out a couple of years during the First World War and a couple of years during the, the Second World War. Um, and they go to fiction and non-fiction writers uh, and poets. Um, so it's a fairly ecumenical award. Um, I've read about a third um, of the writers uh, who have been uh, who have won the prize, um, uh, but I don't love that many of those that I've read. Um, I, there's Hemingway, um, Neruda, I think, who I love a lot, um, um, Saul Bellow, who I love deeply. Uh, Pinter, who I more admire than love. Same thing with Samuel Beckett. Um, and I, I tend to, when, when it's announced, I tend to kind of look at the name. And if I've never heard of it, I think that the choice is, has to be something fairly left field. Um, if it hasn't been or isn't on my radar in, in any way. Um, and I may or may not try one of the, the books. Um, and I certainly won't go out of my way if I if I notice it on in a, at the bookshop, then I, I will. Um, but last year's uh, 2015's um, Nobel laureate I'd never heard of um, uh, Svetlana Alexeyevich, and when I read a profile of her in the um, New Yorker, I didn't particularly interest me. I mean, um, it, it's a very, she's a very interesting, um, her method is, is uh, very unusual. Uh, and is, it's sort of, I, I think, kind of open to, um, what would the word be? Um, not, not suspicion, but, but, I mean, essentially, if you don't know, what she does is she interviews people, mainly women, around a certain subject and transcribes those um, interviews and creates a kind of narrative from them, although all the interviews are sequential. I mean, they don't, they don't, they're not broken up. Um, and you could argue that essentially what she does is interview people and then type up the interviews and publish them. So where is the kind of, you know, the, the, the controlling intelligence, the creative energy, the inspiration, et cetera, et cetera. And I think when I read the New York profile, New Yorker profile, um, uh, that I kind of thought, I, I don't know what I'll get from this. Um, and that actually what I want is, is either a kind of history or a fiction. Um, but anyway, my favorite publisher, um, actually got the rights to her new book, which is Secondhand Time, another very lovely book and very fat book from Fitzcarraldo Editions. And Secondhand Time is essentially um, a whole range of interviews with people from the ages of about 25 through to 90 over the last 10 years. And they are people talking about the post-Soviet experience. People are in the post-Soviet states in Russia talking about how it feels um, after the kind of Gorbachev mini-revolution. Um, so we have some voices which are only, to a certain degree, only know Perestroika and Glasnost and the, the economic revolution towards market capitalism. And then we have some people who have almost gone through the entire uh, Soviet era and, and, and you know, remember um, Stalin and, and to a certain degree even Lenin, who I think died in about 1927. Um, it is one of the most absorbing and brilliant and compulsive pieces of literature I've ever read. Um, I don't know why because they are just verbatim interviews. Um, we almost know um, stage directions. Occasionally she will interpolate into the text, you know, 
so-and-so laughed or so-and-so was paused or whatever, but that's it's very seldom. Um, clearly the subject matter is all important and but I think the form works but the subject matter is or rather the expression of the theme of what it is like to live in post-Soviet Russia or a post-Soviet state um, one can think that there was a uh, there was an interesting, I can't remember who said it, but there was an interesting uh, analysis of the difference between post-Soviet, Soviet, Soviet uh, Russia and states and post-Soviet. And there's this guy who traveled there in, in the 1960s and 70s in the, in the Brezhnev area, era, and it would have been the same before that, said, you know, that there was no color in, in, in the Soviet states. And when he went back in the 19, late 1990s, there was color. Um, and it was a colourful place, but uh, the point here is colour is delivered by advertising. Um, if you are not trying to attract people's attention to go and buy stuff and you don't have posters and signage all over the world, you essentially have bricks and concrete and they are intrinsically drab, um, uh, unless they're heavily contrasted. Um, but any moment you go into the streets where they're trying to sell you stuff, it is all about colour. And I think that's kind of an interesting way of looking at the at what people are saying in this book, because you'd kind of imagine after being let free from Soviet control and domination and being given freedom and choices that you would embrace that. And of course, these people are much more conflicted than that because it does seem that there was something to believe in, that communism and the Soviet dream was something to believe in and something that you could say, I am a part of, and it may not be working now, but we are getting there. We are part of something that is leading somewhere. Um, and that is just opposed by meaningless and empty commercialism and essentially being the same as everybody else. For, you know, for decades, the people of the Soviet Republic essentially were different to everyone. They, they'd created something they believed in, they felt special, and then com market capitalism was essentially that we are the same as everybody else and we still believe that market capitalism is a empty experience and so that it is extraordinary so it is they are weighing up the kind of a kind of existential choice between communist misery but with something to believe in something to hope for, a vision, and empty materialism, which is only an, of itself. It doesn't, it doesn't create anything. It has no future that is going to be better. It is actually about the now. What can I, you know, what can I purchase now? Um, and to read people wrestling with that, even though some of them have gone through the most horrific experience in Soviet Russia, um, that somehow to believe in something is a <clears throat> has more existential bulk within a person's personal identity within their personal identity compared to the freedom to purchase different brands and essentially advertise yourself your externally is a it's a it's a it's so compulsive and fascinating and I feel life changing. I feel completely more than almost any other book I've read in years. I feel as though my entire world view 
the Weltum show on, um, has been reorientated. Um, I mean, I was never a great believer in market capitalism, but what it's not that. It's that it's about the it's about how important idea, hope, and belief is in terms of making our sense of self feel um, as though we're not worthless, that we are contributing, um, and that in misery that can still be an important um, part of life. Sorry, my computer is saying something, but anyway. Um, saying installation alert. I don't quite know what that's doing. Anyway, that's fine. Um, but uh, I know one of you out there is not going to read this. Um, uh, but um, other than that, if you're, re if you're interested in the 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 deep unknowable composition of of self living in the world um, at its most profound this book um, second hand time by Svetlana Islayevich I'm going to show it again is just um, life changing so. Uh, I mean, it's published all over the world in, in, in different translations. This is just the English copy. So, um, but yes, I, I absolutely extraordinary. Thank you.